I'm Cynthia Rowland, and this is episode 73 of EO Radio Show. Today's episode discusses frequently used terms in the nonprofit world pertaining to investment activities. Public charity and private foundation directors and trustees often need to understand their obligations as fiduciaries when trying to determine whether an investment opportunity meets the criteria for a prudent investment, a program-related investment, or a mission-related investment. My goal today is to unpack these terms. I'll cover a basic explanation of the term prudent investment, the term PRI, and the term MRI. I'll cover the statutory requirements for qualifying an investment as a program-related investment, as well as examples of traditional PRIs. And I'll talk a bit about how to think about mission-related investments in the context of an investment portfolio for a public charity or a private foundation. And I'll conclude with some recommendations for ensuring that a private foundation's investments qualify under the rules. Welcome to the EO Radio Show, your nonprofit legal resource, brought to you by the Exempt Organizations Group at Ferella Braun and Martell. My name is Cynthia Rowland, and I'm a partner at Ferella. I'm a business and tax lawyer with more than 30 years of experience advising clients on nonprofit and charity law. Through this podcast, our lawyers and guests will discuss a range of legal and business issues impacting the nonprofit world because we understand you work hard every day to make your community a better place to live and do business. Many of our programs focus on the basics and at times we'll do a deep dive into narrow and complicated legal issues. Again, welcome to the EO Radio Show. We're glad you're here. For many years, the investment lens of fiduciaries of charitable organizations, whether public charities or private foundations, focused almost exclusively on whether the investment of assets, whether those are investment assets that are restricted endowment investments or board-designated investments, whether those met the, the fiduciary standards imposed on fiduciaries responsible for the charitable assets. This standard is known as the prudent investor rule. Many organizations and their investment advisors considered it the goal of the investment team to simply ensure that the investment assets were invested in a diversified portfolio that met the traditional standards for financial risks and commensurate return expectations. In recent years, the prudent investment standard has been modified in nearly every state to allow for the board of directors or trustees to consider other factors in addition to the anticipated return on investment and other economic factors. For a detailed discussion of the current rules, commonly referred to as the rules of UPMIFA, which stands for Uniform Prudent Management of Institutional Funds Act, you may want to go back and listen to EO Radio Show episodes 16 and 35. In those episodes, we talk about the UPMIFA standards and investing in ESG-type assets. So those are good background. But today, we're going to focus on PRIs, MRIs, and how they relate to the prudent investor rules. So to recap, the state laws on UPMIFA generally direct that the board consider a number of factors when investing a restricted institutional fund. And these rules are also generally considered best practices for board-designated endowment investment decisions. The board-designated endowments, generally that refers to investment of assets that are not subject to specific donor-imposed limitations on the investment. There is a a theoretical and a legal distinction between board-restricted assets, which can be changed, and donor-restricted or permanently restricted institutional funds, where the board doesn't have the discretion to change the time for payout or the purpose of payout. Uh, MIFA technically applies only to the latter, that is, donor-restricted assets, but we do use these nine factors that are described in uh, MIFA when considering any investment policy. So here are the nine factors in UPMIFA that we consider in determining whether an investment decision meets the standards of a prudent investment. So here are the factors. Number one, the charitable purpose of the institution and the purposes of the institutional fund. Number two, general economic conditions. Three, the possible effect of inflation or deflation on the investment assets. Number four, the expected tax consequences, if any, of investment decisions or strategies. Number five, the role that each investment or course of action plays within the overall investment portfolio of the fund. Number six, the expected total return from income and the appreciation of investments. Number seven, other resources of the institution. Number eight, the needs of the institution and the fund to make distributions and to preserve capital. And number nine, an asset's special relation or special value, if any, to the charitable purposes of the institution. 
In addition, the UPMIFA laws provide that the board should not make fund management and investment decisions in isolation and should consider the context of the investment fund's portfolio of investments as a whole and as part of an overall investment strategy. The investment strategy must be based on risk and return objectives suited to the fund and to the institution. The board must diversify the investments unless the board members determine that because of special circumstances, the purposes of the fund are better served without diversification. Subject to these standards, the directors can invest an endowment or investment assets if a board designated endowment. The board can, the directors can invest in any kind of property or type of investment. The principles of UPMIFA recognize the duty of care and duty of loyalty imposed on the charity board, and these principles require investment decisions to be made in good faith and with the care an ordinarily prudent person in a like position would exercise under similar circumstances. This requires prudence in incurring investment costs as well, making it clear that the law allows only costs that are appropriate and reasonable. So that's a recap of the rules that circumscribe prudent investment decisions for charitable organizations in general. So now diving into the concept of program-related investments. This is a term, a defined term, that is based entirely on special investment and expenditure rules that apply to private foundations and their fiduciaries and directors under the strict regime of the rules and requirements imposed by the Internal Revenue Code. One Internal Revenue Code section, that is 4942, provides a special rule that says that a private foundation is required to pay out an amount roughly equal to 5% of the value of its net investment assets each year in the form of qualifying distributions. That's a term of art under that rule. A related rule, Code Section 4944, prohibits any investment by a private foundation which may jeopardize the carrying out of the foundation's exempt purpose. However, there is an exception that provides that an investment which qualifies as a program-related investment, that is a PRI, is not considered an investment which jeopardizes the foundation's exempt purpose. And furthermore, investments that meet the terms of this PRI rule, which can include loans and equity investments, will qualify as qualifying distributions for purposes of the 5% minimum distribution requirement. So those are really important exceptions for the managers of private foundations when they want to invest in less conventional investments with perhaps high risk because that investment furthers the foundation's charitable purposes and the foundation fiduciaries want to focus on compliance with the rules applicable to PRIs. An investment that is considered a PRI, by the way, is also specifically allowed under the state UPMIFA and prudent investor rules just discussed because the investment that meets the PRI standards, by definition, is a program expenditure, not an investment of assets that remain subject to the prudent investor rules. So let's dive a little deeper into the definition of a PRI. The Code and Treasury regulations provide that a PRI is an investment that meets the following three criteria. First, the primary purpose of the investment is to accomplish one or more of the following purposes, religious, charitable, scientific, literary, or educational, to foster amateur sports competition or for the prevention of cruelty to children or animals. That's the broad charitable purpose criteria of the Internal Revenue Code. So a PRI, by definition, has to be made for one of those purposes. For a charitable purpose, that is. The second basic criteria for a PRI is that no significant purpose of the investment is the production of income or the appreciation of property. And the third criteria is that no purpose of the investment is to carry on propaganda or otherwise attempt to influence legislation or participate or intervene in any political campaign on behalf of or in opposition to any candidate for public office. So there's significant guidance provided in the Treasury regulations as to what types of investments can qualify as PRIs. The regulations make it clear that to demonstrate that the primary purpose of an investment is charitable, the private foundation must show that the investment significantly furthers the accomplishment of the foundation's charitable activities and that the investment would not have been made but for the relationship between the investment and the accomplishment of the foundation's charitable purposes. 
In determining whether a significant purpose of the investment is the production of income or the appreciation in value of property, the Treasury regulations require consideration of whether a private, profit-seeking investor would have been likely to make the same investment on the same terms. But the fact that an investment produces income or capital appreciation is not standing alone conclusive evidence that the significant income producing is the purpose of the investment. The regulations indicate that in determining the primary purpose of an investment, all of the facts and circumstances surrounding the investment decision will be considered. Turning to the third characteristic of PRIs, that lobbying and political campaigning must not be one of the investment's purposes. If a recipient of the investment communicates with a legislative body with respect to proposed legislation and the expenses of this communication are deductible business expenses to the recipient, then in that kind of a circumstance, the investment is not considered to have been made for prohibited political purposes. But instead, the rules look at whether the lobbying and political campaigning was the point of the investment. If it's not the point of the investment, but the recipient does in fact do some lobbying using other resources, that doesn't doom the PRI. So the takeaway from that is you still need to make sure in the grant agreement or the investment document, the grantee is prohibited from using the investment funds to carry on propaganda or influence legislation. But we don't have to wring our hands excessively over the fact that the grantee might use other resources for that purpose. So let's turn to some examples. Here are some traditional examples of PRIs, low interest or interest-free loans to students with demonstrated financial need, high-risk investments in nonprofit low-income housing projects, low-interest loans to small businesses owned by members of economically disadvantaged groups where commercial investment funds at reasonable interest rates are not readily available, investment in businesses in low-income areas, whether domestic or foreign, an overall plan to improve the economy of the area by providing employment or training for unemployed residents. And another typical area of PRIs has been investments in nonprofit organizations combating community deterioration. The regulations under Section 4944 also contain some detailed examples of investments that qualify as PRIs. Those examples reflect current investment practices and illustrate certain principles, including the following seven ideas. First, an activity conducted in a foreign country furthers an exempt purpose if the same activity would further an exempt purpose when conducted in the United States. A second category is that exempt purposes are served by a PRI may include purposes described in Section 170C2B and are not limited to situations involving economically disadvantaged individuals and deteriorated urban areas. So in other words, any purpose that's in that broad description of charitable activities that I described a few minutes ago are allowable exempt purposes of a PRI, but we're not limited only to situations that involve economically disadvantaged individuals and urban areas. A third important category that's been clarified in the recent revisions to the examples in the Treasury regs is the recipients of PRIs don't need to be within the charitable class if they are the instruments for furthering an exempt purpose. The fourth clarification is that a potentially high rate of return does not automatically prevent an investment from qualifying as program-related. It's also worth noting that PRIs can be achieved through a variety of investments, including loans to individuals, tax-exempt organizations, and for-profit organizations, and equity investments in for-profit organizations. A credit enhancement arrangement, such as a letter of credit to support a bank loan for which the borrower would not otherwise qualify, may qualify as a PRI, again, as long as the purpose of the loan and the use of its proceeds otherwise meets the three basic criteria. And finally, an important note is that a private foundation's acceptance of an equity position in conjunction with making a loan does not necessarily prevent the investment from qualifying as a PRI. For example, a safe or a convertible debt instrument can qualify, again, as long as the purpose of the loan and the use of its proceeds otherwise meets the three basic criteria. So a couple of notes um, for some issues that often come up in the context of PRIs is that changes in the investment itself over the life of it are not necessarily fatal. Once an investment is determined to be program-related, it will continue to qualify as a PRI if changes in the form or terms of the investment are made for appropriate purposes. 
A change made in the former terms of a PRI for the prudent protection of the foundation's investment will not ordinarily cause the investment to cease to qualify as program-related. However, under certain conditions, a PRI may cease to be program-related because of a critical change in circumstances, such as a change that allows the funds to be used for an illegal purpose or if the funds are used to serve the private benefit of the foundation or its managers. If a foundation changes the form or terms of an investment and if the investment no longer qualifies as program-related, then it must be determined whether or not the investment after such change, in fact, jeopardizes the carrying out of its exempt purposes. I did want to make a note about disclosures required for PRIs. The annual information return filed by private foundations requires that the foundation list all of its investments on that annual return, and there are special disclosure rules that apply to PRIs. You may want to take a look at the instructions to the Form 990-PF for more information about the details that are required to be disclosed and keep those in mind when considering a potential PRI. Now, let's turn to our third term for the day mission-related investment. What exactly is that and how does it differ from a prudent investment on the one hand and a program-related investment on the other? When nonprofit leaders refer to mission-related investing, they generally mean a prudent investment that is, at the same time, related to the mission or charitable purpose of the organization. MRIs generally are not meant to meet the strict tests that apply to program-related investments and are generally subject to the prudent investor standard that I talked about at the outset when summarizing the UPMIFA standards and prudent investments generally. The difference here when thinking about an MRI really is in how the board and investment committee think about allocating a portion, or in some cases all of the investments, in alignment with the organization's mission. A board with a focus on mission-related investing would apply the prudent investment standards but limit the pool of investment opportunities to investments that align with the mission. There is no strict definition of an MRI, and it can mean different things to different organizations. The MRI terminology is used in several contexts. In the investment policy, a board will often call out a specific portion of the total investment assets that are available and are intended to be targeted towards supporting the mission. Investments that call out an allocation for mission-related investments often distinguish the MRIs from screens that apply overall. For example, climate organizations may explicitly prohibit investments in businesses that derive revenue from oil and may specifically allocate a portion of the portfolio for investments in businesses in the renewable energy sector. The renewable energy investments might then be promoted as part of the nonprofit organization's commitment to its mission and would not necessarily have to meet the PRI criteria, even if the investing organization is a private foundation. So in that example, the renewable energy investments may be thought of as mission-related investments and called out in the foundation public materials as MRIs as part of their mission, but they're not anything special in terms of the internal revenue code or reporting or qualification requirements. So let's talk about some practical recommendations. As discussed above, under UPMIFA, each person responsible for managing and investing a charity's funds must manage and invest the assets in good faith and with the care an ordinarily prudent person in a like position would exercise under similar circumstances. The trustees and directors must consider the expected tax consequences of investment decisions and the role each investment or course of action plays in the overall investment of the portfolio. The same standards of prudent investing apply to investment decisions generally and investments that are thought of as mission-related, but these don't apply to the program-related investments. For private foundations that do want a particular investment to meet the criteria for program-related investment, either to ensure that the risk profile doesn't trigger exposure to jeopardizing investment rules or simply because it wants to use the investment amount as part of its minimum distribution requirement. Though in that case, the directors and trustees must follow the PRI rules very carefully. Here are some recommendations that will help ensure that the private foundation's decision makers perform adequate due diligence regarding the prudence of the proposed investment and determining whether the investment qualifies as a PRI. In order to demonstrate that an investment is a PRI, the foundation staff should carefully document the reasons for the investment contemporaneously with making the investment decision. 
the investment staff should conduct a market survey and compile any information about the proposed investment, including the purposes of the investment, similar investments based on type, location, or purpose, and potential for profit. Staff may also obtain a market analysis from a professional who's unrelated to the foundation to bolster the analysis. The foundation should also determine if conventional sources of funding are unavailable to provide equity or loan funding to the considered investment. It is not necessary that no other sources of funding are available. However, it is critically important to document what sources of funding are already invested in the target company. If that information is available, if the private foundation's investment has helped secure additional equity or loan funding, that should be documented as well. Prior to making the PRI, the foundation must determine and record the potential impact of the proposed investment on its portfolio and its impact on the foundation's distribution requirements under the minimum distribution rules. Staff should consider what percentage of current foundation assets the proposed investment will represent and whether that is a reasonable percentage given the potential risk. A consideration of the foundation's exit strategy from a PRI is also important, though the exit strategy itself will not necessarily affect whether the investment qualifies as a PRI. For example, if a private foundation proposes an equity investment in a corporation whose shares are not readily marketable, are there restrictions on transferability of those shares? If the foundation proposes to extend loan financing, is there sufficient collateral? There are no required answers in this regard. However, it is important that the decision makers for the foundation actually have an exit strategy in mind. After foundation staff members have completed these inquiries and compiled the suggested documentation, the private foundation's board of directors should carefully review all the information provided. It is important that the board feel comfortable that the investment qualifies as a PRI and that it falls within the foundation's charitable purposes. Depending on the size of the investment relative to the foundation's portfolio, it may also be prudent for the foundation to obtain a written opinion of legal counsel to support the determination that the investment qualifies. And in some cases, it may be appropriate to obtain a private letter ruling from the IRS determining that the proposed investment constitutes a PRI. So finally, turning to the rest of the investment portfolio, those that are not program-related investments, but that are intended to satisfy the prudent investment rule, the practical recommendation there is that the foundation or the charity should work with their investment advisor, working backwards from the needs of the organization for liquidity in the investment funds to meet either current expenditures or whatever budget category is covered by the investment assets. Unlike the PRI rules, which are very much driven by the Internal Revenue Code and tax law compliance, developing the prudent investment policy is a best done in cooperation with investment professionals who can design a diversified portfolio with or without social screens, with or without a mission-related component, but that will meet the need of the organization for liquidity and it to meet its operational needs. So with that, let's wrap up this episode. Be sure to check out the show notes for links to resources on PRIs and the UPMIFA rules. Also, Farella Braun and Martel has a YouTube channel, and there are several nonprofit playlists, including the one we are building covering special topics for private foundations, so look for that link in the show notes as well. I'm Cynthia Rowland, and you've been listening to EO Radio Show, your nonprofit legal resource, brought to you by the Exempt Organizations Group at Farella Braun and Martel. If you have suggestions for topics you would like for us to discuss, please email us at eoradioshow at fbm.com. That's eoradioshow at fbm.com. Thank you for joining us. Until next time, make a difference. Make a difference.